Welcome, hello, my name is Emily Vale. I'm the executive director of the Hudson River Watershed Alliance. Uh, we do these breakfast lectures every second Thursday of the month. And I also wanted to share a save the date for our annual watershed conference. And our on annual watershed conference is usually one day program um, and with lots of talks and lots of networking and gathering. And of course, we're not able to do that in person this year. So we're moving our conference online uh, and it will be over the course of a series of days between October 26th and October 30th in the afternoons. Um, hoping for one to three, one to two hour time frame, but we're still working out a lot of the logistics. So registration and more details to come. But what we're planning is an introductory panel on the Monday the Tuesday will be a plenary session that will be set up like this, like a Zoom webinar. Um, and then the following three days will be a series of more interactive training sessions uh, that are specifically addressing some of the needs that we've identified through our needs assessment. So over the past year or so, the Hudson River Watershed Alliance has been conducting a needs assessment of watershed groups. And we're really excited to share some share some of our findings and also provide trainings to help meet some of the needs that have been identified. So stay tuned for more information on our conference. Uh, we'll be sending out information on our email list and posting online once we have those details confirmed. Great. Another board member, Emily Svensson, tuning in. That's wonderful. Good morning. Um, so as Emily said, this is, this is uh, our first of the fall speaker series for the, what used to be the Poughkeepsie or the, the New Paltz um, Diner Breakfast Series. Um, and we're online until we can meet again in person. Um, but there are some interesting opportunities that come from meeting online and that we can not only have people attending from greater distances, but that we can have speakers from greater distances. Uh, and, um, and Dave Strayer is, is a, a wonderful example of that today. Um, we have uh, speakers now scheduled um, for September, October, November, December. Um, so we have, um, we have the, the year rolling out nicely ahead of us. Um, and um, Dave Strayer is a is a is a guest. Well, he's not a, actually a stranger to this setting. He's spoken to this setting some years ago. But I, when I heard that Dave Strayer was retiring from Cary, I, I I begged him to please come and share with us his unvarnished perspectives on the Hudson River uh, before he left for Michigan. And things didn't quite conspire for that to happen. Uh, but then when we moved into Zoom, I recontacted Dave and said, is some version of that conversation still relevant given what he's currently working on and thinking about? And so today's topic emerged. Um, for those of you who don't, don't know Dave, uh, worked at the Cary Institute for his, most of his career, um, a, a real expert on the Hudson River ecosystems, uh, an extraordinary amount of work uh, on zebra mussels, He's testified before Congress on the damaging effects of invasives. Um, so a, a, a rich and wonderful uh, career and contribution to the understanding of the Hudson Valley and the Hudson River. Um, and he's now been living a little over three years in Michigan. Um, so um, Dave, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, the time is yours between now and 9.30. Um, Emily or I will kind of cut in shortly before 9.30. For those of you who have questions, uh, as Emily said, please put them in chat. Um, and what will happen is that Emily will distill questions because sometimes there are overlapping themes. Um, and, and Emily will feed the questions to Dave afterwards so that he doesn't have to be distracted trying to read them as they pour in <laughs> and be the distiller. Um, and uh, that's how we will... Um, try to address as many questions as we have time for uh, at the end of Dave's talk. So thank you all very much for being here. Um, and Dave, the time is yours. Well, thank, thank you, uh, Russell and Emily, for, for having me here today. And uh, I must say that uh, I'd rather be in New Pulse at the diner where I could have a delicious breakfast and see all of you in person. But uh, this is going to have to do, I guess. See if I can get the technology going here. Come on, you piece of junk. Uh, 
All right. Now I'm assuming you can see my uh, my screen now, Emily and Russell. Yep. Okay. Good. So uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, what's a river river worth, and this question bothers me for a couple of reasons. The, the first is there's this sort of implication in the question that a river could be bought and sold like a pack of gum or something, and I, I find that offensive. Uh, the other reason is I don't like talking about this is that the answer to this question really has to do as much with economics and philosophy as it does with ecology, and those are topics that I don't know much about. But especially since ecosystem services have come to the fore in the last few decades, we're increasingly seeing efforts to value uh, rivers as part of decision making. And I think it's important for, for people who study or manage or advocate for rivers to know enough about these valuation exercises to, to be able to participate in them if they would like to, uh, or to be, be able to evaluate the, the, the valuation exercises that they see. So I found it useful to learn a little bit about valuing rivers. And, um, and I want to share a little bit of, uh, uh, about that, this material with you today in the hopes that it may, you may find it helpful as well. So here's a outline of the talk. It's going to be a pretty superficial talk. Uh, I want to consider four questions. Why might we want to try to set a value on a river? We're not actually selling the Hudson River, so why would we want to try to value it? Uh, what kinds of values do rivers provide? I want to consider a few important complications and caveats that you need to consider when you're looking at evaluation exercise. And I want to close by considering how uh, can, can, can we, the people in this, in this call really, uh, help society better value rivers? So I'm going to open by, you know, why, why would we try to put a dollar value on a river? The, the first reason we might want to do this is to demonstrate the importance of a river. And I've got some uh, quotes from a, a, a valuation study of my local river here in Michigan, the Huron River. A couple of years ago, they commissioned the, a evaluation exercise for the river and they concluded well, you can see what they concluded, but they conclude the river is very valuable in terms of economic terms. Uh, it contributes to a lot of jobs, adds property value and so forth. And it should be, I guess it's probably obvious to you, the reason why you do this is to get a seat at the table, to get the river a seat at the table and things like planning exercises. So you're trying to get the uh, county commissioner or the city council member to answer your phone call you're trying to get a seat at, a, at a, a planning meeting, for example, and you're trying to get the river the same kind of consideration that maybe uh, local agriculture would get in planning exercises or, uh, you know, the local GM assembly plan or something like or something like that. And so you put together valuation uh, figures like this and it shows the river is valuable and needs to be considered when you could, when you're thinking about what to do with the region. The second reason you might want to try to put a dollar value on rivers is, is to evaluate alternative actions. So here, there's a couple pictures here of a, of a dam before and after dam removal. This is a complicated decision. You're trying to decide whether to take a dam out or other management actions. And one way that you might decide what to do would be to, to try to put a value on uh, the, the river before and after certain management actions or, or consider how, how valuable the river would be in, in different options that you're considering. And, um, and, and so obviously you, you, you're thinking, well, I'll, I'll pick the alternative that has the, the greater dollar value. The other way you might use evaluation exercise uh, in, in decision-making is, is, is not literally to estimate a dollar value, but just to try to help you organize your discussion. And I'll, t I'll talk about this a little later in the, in the talk. And this is something that's probably more common than actually putting a dollar value on. And a, a, a third reason you might wanna put a dollar value on a river is to, is to estimate damages. Sometimes something happens to a river and somebody is, is responsible for damages and uh, you need to come up with a dollar value for uh, how much damage was done and how much the responsible party owes. So I think there are several pretty good reasons why you might want to 
put a dollar value on, on, on a river. I'm gonna move on now to considering what kinds of values that rivers provide. And um, there are several ways you can classify these values. I think some of you probably are familiar with the uh, ecosystem services framework that's in use with the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment and other places where people talk about uh, uh, su supporting services and provisioning services and so forth. I'm gonna be using a a different classification, which is from conventional economics, which I find a little easier to use. I, I don't think it's essential which classification of values you use, as long as you're careful about assigning values and you're comprehensive so you don't, you don't miss classes of values. So this is the valuation framework I'll be using. As I said, this is a pretty standard thing from economics as far as I can tell. And broadly speaking, the values that a, river's, a river provides can be divided into use values and non-use values. Use values are, as the name would apply, they're things that we use the value that we use the river for. So we might use the river as a source of uh, uh, drinking water or hydropower. These are direct uses of the river. Um, there are less obvious indirect uses, which I'll talk about in a minute, that where the river is supports something that we use that's not in the river. And then there's option phase, which is the future use of the river. Then there are a class of non-use phase that I, and I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with, with this class because uh, how can something have a value if we don't use it? But these are well established in economics and as we'll see, they can be, these non-use values can be large. So I'm going to step through in the next few minutes, I'm going to step through these different classes of values and how they might apply to a river. I will note, uh, I'm going to go in order kind of from the top to the bottom, and I'll note that uh, the values at the top of this diagram are easier to estimate in terms of dollars than the ones as you move down the, the, down the chart here, they get harder and harder to estimate in terms of dollar value. But that doesn't mean, but just because I'll, I'll keep saying this, just because something is hard to estimate doesn't mean that it's trivially small. And we'll see that in a minute. All right, so let's start with the easy ones, the direct use market values. Rivers provide a bunch of things that are bought and sold on the open market. Uh, so here, this is a picture of the Shokan Reservoir. We use rivers uh, as sources of drinking water. Uh, there are commercial fisheries. Historically on the Hudson, there were commercial fisheries. Rivers are used as sources of hydropower. Uh, they also, uh, the scenic picture in the lower right is to remind me to say that rivers enhance property values. And so a, a property that's on the river or has a view of the river can be worth more than, um, than one that is, uh, that doesn't have a river view. These are all things that we directly use rivers for and they're all bought and sold on the market. And so that means they're relatively easy to assign values to because we have market prices to help us indicate values. And so here are a few examples of, of what these amounts, these values for direct uses of the river uh, might be, uh, what, what they might be. So in the Hudson Basin, the drinking water drawn from, from essentially streams, from reservoirs, uh, is, is, has got a, a direct market value of about $1 billion a, a year. Uh, the commercial fisheries, the shad fishery, used to be worth uh, about 300000 a year. Hydropower generation in the Hudson Basin is, is a, about a half billion dollars a year. And I don't have an estimate for enhanced property values uh, in the Hudson Basin. Um, but in, in that Huron River study I mentioned a few minutes ago, properties that were on the river, the Huron River, were worth about 50% more that, than comparable houses that were not on the water. And I, I should point out that this, this, this property value thing is a little different than the other ones. You don't buy and sell a view of the river, right? I mean, it isn't like you'd on the Home Depot and, and, and say, I need to buy some PVC pipe and a view of the river. But so we don't have a price in the sense that we have prices of other things, but you can see what houses sell for that have 
uh, river views and don't have river views and, and back out an estimate of the market value of a river view in that way. So my point here is that these are values, these direct use market values are, are ones that are, are relatively easy to estimate. And you'll see that these are, these can be very large. So in, in the case of the Hudson Basin, the rivers of the Hudson Basin, we're talking about billions, billions of dollars with a B, billions of dollars a year in, um, in direct use values for these uses. There are other direct uses that aren't bought and sold on the market, so they're a little harder to value. So we have recreational boating or bird watching or uh, fishing or in, in the lower right, you got a guy down there, I don't know what he's doing exactly, sitting by the river, maybe he's writing a song or maybe he's thinking about his girlfriend or maybe he's wondering what he's going to do next. But he's, uh, you see people using the river uh, for all these sorts of ways and, and in ways that they're not paying for. We don't have a meter on our kayak, that's, thank God, that's, that's charging us, you know, 50 cents a mile for every mile that we go in our kayak. The, Bird watchers here aren't paying per bird. It isn't like they, they go down there and somebody says, you want to watch a bird? 50 cents a bird, three for a dollar. And so we don't have a market price to indicate these, these direct use values. But there are ways to estimate. Um, so there are, th these, these values are harder to estimate. There are ways to estimate them. And I'm not going to go into any detail, but a common way is travel costs. So you might say, well, uh, we know that that recreational fisherman spent $13 to, to drive over from wherever he lives and go to the river and go fishing. And so we know that the fishing experience is worth at least $13 to that angler. Or we might uh, uh, conduct surveys of people's willingness to pay. So you might ask them, you know, well, uh, would you would you pay $10 to kayak in, uh, in, in the river? Well, what about 20 uh, and so forth. And so there are ways to estimate these direct use values that aren't bought and sold on the market. And again, when, when people do those estimates, they come up with large estimates for the value of these direct uses. So there was an economic study of the Delaware River Basin just a couple of years ago uh, and, and it estimated that the recreational boating in the Delaware Basin was worth about 800 million a year, bird watching about 100 million a year. There's some work uh, from New York State on the value of recreational angling. And the figure for the Hudson Basin is probably in the range of 20 to 200 million dollars a year. Uh, I, I haven't seen any estimates for the value of sitting by the river and contemplating, but people certainly do that and it's certainly valuable to them. So these other direct use values also are very large and we're talking about something in the range of hundreds of millions of dollars a year to billions of dollars a year in, again, in, likely in the Hudson Basin. There are also indirect uses that, that, we, uh, that we use a river for, but not directly that are valuable to us. And these come largely from the connections between the river and adjacent ecosystems. So for example, the river may supply irrigation water or deposit silt and enhance the fertility of, 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 of riverside fields. If we were sitting in the diner in New Paltz, I'd be able to gesture towards the flats out on the wall kill, uh, which benefit from the, um, from the existence of the wall kill river there as a source of silt and irrigation water. The Hudson is also connected to the atmosphere and it may sequester carbon or greenhouse gases and it's connected to the ocean. So uh, the Hudson removes lots and lots of nitrogen, reactive nitrogen and prevents it from polluting coastal waters. The Hudson also serves as a nursery ground for a not migra valuable migratory fishes. So it helps support things like the striper fishery, striped bass fishery up and down the East Coast. And all of these have economic value in these ecosystems that are adjacent to or connected to the Hudson. I don't know any estimates of the dollar value, these indirect use values for the Hudson Basin, but it's reasonable to guess that, again, that we're probably talking about hundreds of millions to billions of dollars uh, a year in value. 
All right, so I'm gonna move on now to these more elusive values down towards the bottom part of that diagram. Um, these include, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, in a minute I'll define and explain what these are, but these include the existence value, altruism value, option value, and bequest value. These are mostly non-use values. They value that derives from something other than something that we use about the river. These are usually hard to estimate. And as a result, they're often omitted from valuation exercises. It's very common when you see these economic valuation exercises to, for the introduction of the paper or the study to mention these values and then have them disappear from the rest of the exercise. Now, it's important, I think, to, that when, when someone says they're not going to estimate something because it's too hard to estimate, that is the same as asserting that the value of that, of that item is zero. And as we'll see in a minute, this is demonstrably false, that existence values, altruism values, option and bequest values, these are non-zero. And so by, say, by omitting them, you're making, I think, an indefensible assumption. Uh, and as we'll see, these values, to the extent that we know them, uh, can be quite large. I'm going to start with uh, existence value. This is, uh, I, I love this picture. This is the world's largest set of rapids on the lower Congo River in Africa. Uh, and and th these are amazing. They're, 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 they're physically hugely energetic. The river here gets has pools in them that are more than 200 feet deep. And there's this uh, rich endemic biota of fishes and shellfish and all other things that they live in there. This is one of the most inaccessible places on the surface of the planet. Now, <clears throat> I'm never going to go there. I don't eat fish from the Congo River. I don't use hydropower from the Congo River. I'm certainly not going to go kayaking in the Congo River. I'm not nuts like these people. Um, and so how could the Congo River have any value to me? It has value because I like the idea that it exists and I'll pay to support its continued existence. So it's likely that someday these rivers, this rapids is gonna be destroyed through some massive hydropower projects. And if I could, I would pay money to prevent that. I would pay money to, to buy solar generating power in Africa to provide electricity in lieu of uh, hydropower, for example. And so the fact that I'm willing to pay money to preserve this rapids means that it has value to me. And existence values I, I may, may have religious or ethical origins. I think we're all familiar with the idea that some people think that we have a religious or ethical duty to preserve biodiversity or pre preserve environmental quality. And this is the, uh, the sort of bedrock that underpins existence value. Or we may just uh, have an aesthetic, uh, the, the existence value may have an aesthetic origin uh, where we just think something is cool and we would like to preserve it. Existence values can be greatly affected by education. And so um, I think probably many of you have seen this happen. I've seen this happen. Chris Bowser talks about eels, right? And so he came over to Cary one day and there was a whole auditorium full of bored high school and college students uh, who really didn't think they cared about eels. If, if you had asked them before Chris's talk, what they would pay to preserve the eel population in the Hudson River. Uh, I don't know, you would have got maybe a couple bucks in the coffee can where, where somebody uh, was feeling sorry for Chris. Then he gives this talk, he gives this amazing talk about what wonderful creatures eels are, how interesting are, they are, and how lucky we are to be sharing a planet with these amazing fish. And, and you just see the auditorium light up and I don't know how much money could be raised after Chris's talk, but I know that it's a lot more uh, to preserve eels. And I know that it's a lot more than before his talk. Chris's talk raised the existence value of eels uh, for that audience. Existence values can be hard to estimate. They're usually done through surveys. The results are controversial a lot of times, but uh, th we have very good evidence that existence values are real and they can be large. And I, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. The first is that people give a lot of money to 
to groups like the World Wildlife Fund to preserve nature. The contributions to WWF uh, in the last five year period that I could get data for were $1.1 billion. It's hard to think of this 1.1 billion as anything other than existence value. People are not sending money to WWF in the expectation that they're gonna get frozen panda steaks in the mail once a month. They're not going to get anything to eat. They're not going to, most of the people to give money to WWF are never gonna to go to visit the project sites. They're not gonna watch birds. They're not gonna watch pandas. Uh, they, they're, they're, it's hard to think of this being any kind of a use value indicated by this $1.1 billion. It's, I believe, existence value. People are giving money to WWF because they want ecosystems and species to continue to exist on the planet. Another example of a large existence value is the Exxon Valdez settlement. I, I guess many of you remember this. There was a oil tanker that went aground up in Alaska, Prince William Sound, uh, made a big mess up there. There's a $2 billion settlement uh, that, uh, to, 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 to settle the damages caused by the Exxon Valdez. This was largely existence value. It wasn't because the people of the United States <clears throat> were deprived of fish to eat. It was because we were deprived of the existence of this of this pristine ecosystem that had been damaged by the oil spill. So existence values are real, they can be large, they're recognized by courts in the United States, and it's, I, again, I, <clears throat> sorry to be beating this dead horse, but it's a mistake to assume that they're zero. All right, altruism values. This is one that <clears throat> doesn't get discussed much in practice. The idea is we, we value a resource so that others can use it even though we're not using it ourselves. So the example I'm choosing here, this is a fisherman in the Irrawaddy River in Myanmar. There's this wonderful cooperative fishery between people and dolphins there. This is the Irrawaddy dolphin in the foreground here. The fishermen and the dolphins work together to catch fish. The fishermen catch the, the fish in a the net. They share the fish with the, uh, with the dolphin. Uh, I would pay money to ensure that this fishery continues. I don't use it. I'd like them to continue to be able to use the river in this way. And so that's an altruism value. In practice, um, I think that most of the surveys that you, you would run to, to estimate existence value would also capture altruism value uh, as part of that. Option bequest values are the other two values I want to talk about. Uh, that's the value of keeping something uh, in the expectation you might, might want to use it in the future. That's an option value. Or keeping it because your descendants might want it. That's a bequest value. We're familiar with this. I think most of us have rooms like this somewhere in our house or garage or attic or something like that. We have a lot of stuff that we're not using. Why are we using valuable space to store this stuff? Because, because we think we might use it someday or we want to give it to our <clears throat> children or nephews or nieces or somebody like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. A few characteristics of option and bequest values. Uh, they typically are high if you don't know the true value, of, the full value of something. So in the case of your attic, maybe you've got an oil painting that looks like it's in a fancy frame and it's got signed, it's signed by some French guy. And uh, so you, you're gonna keep it because you think it might be worth something. You don't know. Uh, in the case of an ecosystem, you might assign high option value because you don't yet fully understand what it's worth. That should sound familiar. Uh, option and bequest values may be high if you know the situation is likely to change. So maybe I've got a tuba that I'm keeping in my attic because I, I don't play it now, but I'm gonna retire in a few years and by God, it's my lifelong dream to learn how to play the tuba and, 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 and play in a new pop am, band when I'm retired. And in the case of ecosystems, we know the situation is likely to change and the things like climate change and sea level rise. So we may assign high option values to something because we know the situation tomorrow is gonna to be different than the situation today. And 
you may have high bequest values if you think your descendants may have different values than you do. They'll like something that you don't like. And I'll talk about this more in a minute. These option and bequest values also are hard to estimate. They're usually estimated through surveys. They're not necessarily trivially small and they can be increased through education. So that's the kind of a typical list that you might come up with with what Values of Rivers provides. And so you might think, well, all we do is we look at the, the river with the dam, the river without the dam. We estimate these values that I just, that I just described. We add them up and we decide whether situation A has a higher value than situation B and go with the one with the high value. And that, you know, it's complicated, but now we're done. Uh, and so now we're gonna, it's not really quite that simple. And I wanna discuss a, a, a few complications and caveats that are worth keeping in mind if you're involved in or evaluating a, a evaluation exercise. The first thing is, and I've already said this, you can't just ignore values that are hard to estimate. So s suppose you own this lovely house uh, and you're gonna, I don't know, you're gonna get a loan and you, you, the bank sends over an appraiser. And it's like five o'clock in the afternoon and there's this old wheezy guy shows up and his, his knees are killing him. And he says, uh, you know what, I've had a rough day. I'm just gonna go in the dining room and look at the dining room and we'll, ask, we'll value your house based on what's in the dining room. You'd say, what are you, nuts? You can't do that. The reason you can't do that is the house is filled with rooms and each of the rooms has value to it. You gotta look at the whole house. And rivers are like houses with many rooms. There's lots of aspects of rivers and they all have values. And if you wanna value the river, you gotta look in all the rooms. So this has been this, these incomplete valuations, in my opinion, have been the source of some of our past problems with river management. We've tended to look at the easy to estimate direct use phase like hydropower, things that provide private benefit. And we ignore the other stuff that's hard to estimate. And it's well known in economics that this sort of an approach leads you to overvalue the private benefits and undervalue the public goods. And we've had lots and lots of, in my opinion, uh, as, uh, of examples of river mismanagement that are based on these incomplete valuations. As we move into an ecosystem services framework, there's been an in increase in the number of kinds of values that we estimate now. Maybe we estimate the value of recreational boating and hydropower, but many of the valuations still leave out some of the hard to estimate values. Things like this, this, this guy contemplating the river or option or bequest values or existence values. And this is the same logical error that we've been, that we've been subject to for, for the last few decades in river management. And it, it leads to the same kinds of problems. You undervalue rivers and perhaps more important, you distort the value of different kinds of options in favor of the easy to estimate uh, values and away from the hard to estimate, typically public benefit values of the river. The second caveat I wanna mention is, is the question of whose values count. Uh, I haven't talked about this before, but who do we ask to value the river? The people who live right on the river, the people in the watershed, the, the people who visit the area? Uh, who exactly are we asking to value the river? Should we give more weight to some opinions, like people who live right on the ecosystem or have close connections to it or who've lived there longer? Do they get greater weight? Do experts, like river experts uh, or economists, do their opinions get greater weight? Do people even outside the legal jurisdiction making the decision have any voice? You might, you might say, well, why should they? But you know, I'd kind of like to have a voice into what happens with the Congo River Rapids. And if you think you should be considered when we're uh, thinking about the Congo River Rapids, then maybe people from outside the Hudson need to be considered when we're thinking about the Hudson. The question of whose value count is critically important because your estimate of value is gonna strongly depend on whose values are included. 
Another complication is, is what exactly should we maximize in our value calculations? I've talked up till now, like we just add up the values and we take the option with the highest total value. So the river with the dam is worth $38 million. The river without the dam's worth $42 million. And so we take the dam out. But you, you, you may not want to base your decisions on total value because total value doesn't consider other things that, that you may care about, like fairness, for example. You, the option that has the highest total value may be really bad for some set of stakeholders. So you might have an option that, that has the highest total value that, that would eliminate farming from the watershed. And you may have another option that only has slightly lower total value, but allows the farmers to stay in business. And I think many of us would, would say, well, gosh, that, that sounds better to me. It's, it, it doesn't have quite the highest total value, the, the highest economic efficiency, but it increases the fairness of the decision. So other things that you might consider other than total value, you might try to minimize the number of deeply unhappy people. And there are decision support tools that, that do this sort of thing where you, you try to pick a solution that minimizes the number of very, very unhappy people. Or you might try to minimize the risk of a disastrous mistake. You might have an option that has a very high total value, but uh, has uh, just this teensy risk of irreversible damage to the river. And so you may want to avoid that. You also may have uh, some alternatives that violate something that you think of as fundamental rights and should be taken off the table. So a lot of times people don't like to consider options that kill people, result in animal suffering or destroy sacred sites. And so it isn't obvious that you simply would want to maximize total value. And then finally, the question of the rights of future generations is more complicated than bequest values would suggest. So I said, well, we can assign a bequest value, but the trouble with assigning a bequest value is we don't know what our descendants were value. And so we can leave something for them, but we may not leave something that they care about. A good example of this problem of changing values is wetlands. So if you've gone back 100 years ago and, and even talked to people about bequest values and had a very explicit discussion about what they would like to leave us, the chances are they would not have left us wetlands because wetlands were wastelands in the, in the, in the, in the period, in, in that time period. And they had no way of knowing that we would value wetlands. We have no way of knowing what people a hundred years from now will value about the Hudson. And I don't see an easy solution to this except to be very, very careful about making any decision uh, that would be hard to re hard or impossible to reverse. All right, so I wanna move on to the, my last topic about how, how we can help people better value rivers. And I wanna use an analogy to, 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 to get into this topic. So Russell said I moved to Ann Arbor a couple of years ago. Suppose I'm cleaning out the garage here and I find this old chair. I don't know anything about chairs. It looks just like a ratty old chair to me. And so I don't place a very high value on it. In fact, I'm gonna go, to, I'm, gonna, I'm taking it out to the curb to be thrown out with the garbage. Well, as it happens, my neighbor, <clears throat> let's say, is one of the guys on the antique road show. He knows tons about chairs. And he looks at that chair and he says, you know, that's funny. I haven't seen that chair in years. Bob Seeger, the rock and roller, he's from Ann Arbor. He used to live in your house back in the 60s before he was famous. And when he was a little boy, his mom would set this chair up in the yard and he cut Bob's hair. She'd cut Bob's hair in that chair. He hated it. He hated having his hair cut. Or, or the antiques guy might say, oh, that's interesting. I haven't seen one of those chairs in years. There used to be a chair factory out where the Walmart is now. They made millions of these things. Every house in the Midwest had them, but they're, they're almost all gone now. They were just cheap chairs and nobody saved them. Or he might say, look at, the, look at the seat of that chair. Look at the way the rush has been woven into that seat. That's, that's Lithuanian. So we used to have a little Lithuanian community here and they had this peculiar way of building these chairs. 
Now, he didn't say anything. My neighbor didn't say anything about dollar value of this chair. But everything he said to me makes me value the chair more. I'm much less likely to take it out to the curb. And I'm much less likely if somebody comes by and say, hey, I'll give you two bucks for that chair. I'm much more likely to say, you know, I, I think it's worth more than two bucks. Or my neighbor could just say, oh, my gosh, that chair is valuable. You could sell that for $1,000. All of these things would help me better value that chair. I think many of the people who live in, in and around the Hudson and our other rivers know less about the river than, we know, than I know about chairs. And we all know lots about rivers. We know that the Hudson and other rivers are, are interesting. We know all kinds of fascinating things about the, uh, about the Hudson and the plants and animals that live in it. We, we know that it's been badly damaged by human action. We know that it's threatened by future human action. We know it's special, it's unique. We even know it's valuable. I just told you that the rivers in the Hudson Basin are worth billions of dollars a year. Most people don't know that. We can be the antiques roadshow guys for, for the Hudson and other rivers and help our society better value rivers. So here's a bunch of specific ways I think that opportunities where we can help society better value rivers those of us who are scientists can conduct research to quantify functions. We can all co cooperate with social scientists to try to convert those ecological functions into values, whether they're dollar values or other kinds of values. I already said we can be the antiques roadshow guys. I may, to, may need to dress better if I'm gonna do that, but we can do that. And we can participate in public discussions and debates, providing expert information, pushing for the inclusion of, of all stakeholders, and pushing for the inclusions of all kinds of values, including the ones that are less commonly estimated or discussed. So I gave this talk here at, U, at, at, at University of Michigan when I was practicing a couple of years ago. And, and, and the reaction I got was, gosh, this is too hard. We can't do this. It's, it's, it's too hard. And it is hard it, 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 to, to, to put a dollar value on, the, on, on something like the Hudson River is hard. And if to do it well, you're not, you're not gonna do it. You're not gonna have three of us sit around in a, in a conference room for an afternoon and come up with a credible, uh, credible dollar value for what the Hudson is worth. It's gonna take time and money and expertise and thought to, to do that in, to, to dollar value the Hudson. Nevertheless, I think there are times when it might be worth doing. So I understand you guys are, are, have been considering a storm barrier down in New York City. Uh, I don't know if that's still on the table. That's a, that's a huge project. It is, it's gonna have large long-term consequences and it just might be worth spending uh, the time and money to do a valuation exercise uh, as part of that decision-making process. However, this values framework can be, can be useful even if you don't do a full dollar evaluation. I've already said you can express some values in terms of alternative currencies. You can talk about the number of users. Uh, you can even just discuss values in a narrative way. You can have, somebody could say, you know, I, I like to go down to the river. I sit down by the river when things are tough. When, I, when I'm not feeling good, I get down there and I, I just watch the, watch the water go by and then I feel better. I go back and deal with my problems. And it's valid to discuss values in ways other than dollars. And that could still be useful. I think the real utility of evaluation exercise is to lay out a framework where you can systematically consider and discuss all kinds of values, all kinds of things that the river is used or not used uh, in the case of non-use values, uh, used for. All right, so here's my conclusions. I think I said all this stuff. Rivers like the Hudson are immensely valuable. Uh, I think you know there, there's very strong evidence that the Hudson and its tributaries are worth billions of dollars a year. Uh, many large rivers uh, are equally valuable although the details of what they're valuable for are gonna vary from river to river. 
the, the ways, obviously, the ways in which we manage a river affect its value to us. The total value of a river is made up of many pieces. And it, I think it's possible that a careful evaluation of the value of a river may aid in management. Certainly, sloppy valuation has led to poor choices and will continue to lead to poor choices. So we need to push for good valuation if, we, if we're doing it. And that those of us who are on this, this call, uh, river scientists, managers, advocates can help society better value rivers and make better choices. So thank, for your, thank you for your time today. And if there are questions, I'll try to answer them. Great, thank you so much, Dave. This is really informative. We have unsurprisingly some really good questions here. Um, so start with one about the river versus the watershed. So how do you separate the river from its watershed when looking at values such as agriculture versus fishing versus boating? For example, how much should the value of trout fishing in the Catskills be assigned to the Hudson River or agriculture in the Wallkill and so on? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I didn't, and I didn't talk about the scope. I, I think it depends on what you're trying to, to do. It, it you know, kind of comes back to why are you doing a valuation exercise? And uh, myself, I tend to think of the Sopus Creek as part of the Hudson. And, 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 and so for some valuation exercises, it would make sense to uh, include all of the running waters. Uh, for others, it would make sense to include all of the watershed, right? I mean, you, you, you might include the fields along the wall kill as part of the Hudson. Uh, so it would just depend on, you know, why exactly you're doing evaluation exercise. Great, thank you. Um, for a river like the Hudson, far from pristine, but located in a highly populated area, would it stand to reason that it might have a very high existence value because a lot of people are intimately familiar with it? The examples you focused on, um, I think this was earlier in the talk, were more pristine ecosystems that we might value because they are remote and relatively unaltered. So that's a really excellent point. Uh, the, the value of a river depends on the context, right? And so, uh, so the existence value of the Hudson could be really, really different from the existence value of the Washita River in Oklahoma. You'd expect that. Um, and I guess I'll digress here. There's something, there's a technique in, in valuation called benefit transfer that some of you know about or benefits transfer. And the idea is that if you want a shortcut evaluation exercise, in, let's say you don't want to estimate the value of nitrogen removal uh, in your river and you're just going to take that somebody's already done this for the Chesapeake Bay, the Susquehanna and the Chesapeake Bay, and they have a value of so many dollars per pound of nitrogen removed, right? And so you're going to take that and apply it to the Wachita in, in, uh, in Oklahoma. And the problem with that is that a pound of nitrogen is worth really different amounts of money in different places. The value of the of riverbank for contemplation is going to be really, really high in Manhattan and not so high in Hickory Corners, Michigan. And, uh, and so you really do need to consider the context and these benefits transfer for techniques are seductive because they're easy to do, but you really need to be careful about that sort of thing. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question about minimum valuations. Um, is there a need for minimum valuations, i.e. you just need to show that a river in present condition is greater than it would be under some extractive use? Devil's advocate, you just need a number that's bigger than some direct use to support the status quo. Yeah, again, it depends on the value of your exercise. So uh, I, I'm very suspicious of incomplete valuations as, as should be, uh, be obvious from my talk. But there are times when, well, let's take, let's take the, the Hudson, the drinking water value of the Hudson. That's a real easy one. It's really big. It's a billion dollars a year and, and it's really firm. You know, we know that number. It's the, the New York City Water Department that publishes those figures. And, um, and, and so there are times when you just need to demonstrate that the river is valuable. Uh, 
Um, and so you say, look, it's worth at least a billion dollars a year, go away. Um, it, but the trouble with an incomplete valuation, if you're considering two alternatives, is that you don't know those unestimated values in the two alternatives. And, and that's where we screwed up in the past, that, that we don't, when, when people have, uh, you know, put in peaking hydropower and maybe it reduced the, the, uh, the uh, recreational value of the river, for example, uh, they haven't considered that in their calculations. And so the trouble with a minimum valuation is if you have, if you have two alternatives, you know, alternative A is worth at least $10 million. Alternative B is worth at least $15 million. What, where does that get you? And so, uh, uh, you know, I can see that in some cases where a minimum valuation could be really useful. In other cases, it's going to be really misleading. Great. Thank you. Um, that's actually a really good segue. The next question that came in was about that $1 billion estimate for drinking water value for the Hudson Basin um, and wondering how that was broken out, if that was entirely the New York City reservoir system or if the other um, smaller reservoirs or even the Hudson itself as a drinking water source was factored into that, um, that value. Well, first off, you notice there was a tilde before that $1 billion estimate. It's in the, it's, it's in the range of a billion dollars. Where I came up with that number is I, is I went to the New York City Water. Uh, uh, they have an annual report. And then I also went to the city of Poughkeepsie and the city of Albany, because uh, Albany also draws from the, uh, a reservoir that's fed by a tributary of the, of the Hudson. And I, I just wanted to verify that these uh, smaller systems weren't gigantic values compared to New York City, and they aren't. I think New York City's was something like 800 million. And then so you add a little bit more and a little bit more. And, and you know, I wouldn't defend that the number is exactly 1 billion, but it's in that neighborhood. If Look, I, was, I did this for the talk, Emily, uh, and, uh, and, and questioner. And so if you were going to do this for real, you'd go out to all the water systems and you'd look at all their annual reports. And it, 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 it could be done. Uh, I was too lazy to do it for every water user in the, in the basin. I think that's helpful to get a sense of scale though too, that um, obviously New York City has a lot of resources and they put a lot of work. There's a lot of incentive for them to have this specific value, but to know that you know, Poughkeepsie and Albany at a smaller scale are also can be included in that. I think that's, that's helpful to understand. They, 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 they can be. And the other interesting thing was that, that uh, the Delaware system, the valuation I mentioned, also included drinking water. And to the extent that I understand that other valuation, it looks to me like New York City's uh, values of drinking water per capita are actually lower than for these smaller systems. So thinking about scale, the next question is about valuation um, and how it can be used for public policy, but wondering if it can also be used at a smaller scale to support environmental care by businesses and landowners. Yeah, I'm not sure what, uh, what, what the questioner is thinking of uh, there. If, are, are you thinking of a business saying we're doing this and it, uh, it provides $20 million in environmental benefits. Uh, I could see somebody doing that and wanting to show that they're a good steward. Uh, and that would be uh, uh, something that might be good for a company or an individual to do. I'm not sure if that's the sense of the question though. So Barbara, if you're out there and you have cla a more clarifying uh, question, I see Chris Bowser is, has joined us. Uh, hi, Bowser. Um, the, uh, so the next question um, is about the value of a river as a waste removal system or yep. dumping ground. Yeah, I didn't, I, I, I didn't include that. Just I, I did not, I should have been clearer about this. I did not include all of the values of the Hudson. I didn't try to catalog all of them. So waste assimilation is an important one, right? We dump waste in, the, in our rivers and the, the rivers make a lot of that stuff go away. 
and that has large value. Uh, and, and the way you that's conventionally estimated is a replacement cost. And so you say, what would it cost to build an industrial facility, a waste treatment facility that does the same treatment that the river is doing for us? And in, in cases where people have done that, those values can be quite high also. Great, and, and I see that Barbara's clarified um, her question about businesses and residents that um, currently environmental care is always a gift. How might we reward people who take care of the environment? Uh, gosh, that's a, that's a question for somebody other than me, I'm afraid. It's a good, it's a good question. And, and um, I guess one of the shortcomings of the talk I just gave is it doesn't talk about any of the impl implementation or use of this stuff, uh, which would be a whole nother talk. And uh, you could certainly imagine a bunch of different ways to reward a business from actually giving, rewarding them, paying them money. And that, that's, there are, you, you know this, I expect, there are schemes to pay for environmental service or eco ecosystem services, right? And you could, you could do that. Or you could have some recognition program. You know, there'd be lots of ways you could, you could, you could do this. And I, I'm sorry, it's really not something I know about. Um, the next question has to do with how these methods might apply at this particular moment in time. So, with a willingness to pay question, do you have any thoughts about asking that type of question? during COVID when people might really be undervaluing ecosystem services and the like when job and food security may be the prevailing concerns? That's a good question. My, my impression is that, is that these willingness to pay surveys require great care in how they're designed and interpreted. Uh, you can imagine a set of questions that could elicit really different answers than another set of questions, right? And so there's a whole literature on the proper way to, to do this. I don't know about the timing in, in COVID times versus non-COVID times. Here locally in Michigan, people are really using the outdoors right now. Uh, and, and I would not be astonished to see uh, higher values among some people, higher valuations of nature right now than, 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 than a year ago. But it would, it's, so I don't know the answer about COVID. I do, I do know that people who do these surveys worry a lot about how exactly they do them so that they get an answer that's defensible. Great, thank you. Emily, I think I should jump in. Um, it's 9.30. Um, this has been terrific. Uh, Dave, so many provocative ideas to me, one of the big ones as a practitioner working in the consulting arena is the question of scale. Um, the, the measuring rubrics that you've described are primarily at the river level, or at least at the, at the, the watershed or the subwatershed level, but almost all pro projects are done at the site scale. So it's a real interesting translation question um, just, for, just to muse on. I love your idea of the road show. Chris Bowser gets a shout out. Um, and many others do. And in fact, I think you made the point that virtually everybody on this call who thinks about these issues is part of the road show. It's, it's what we do. We, we speak for the values of the watershed and the Hudson and the Watershed Alliance has that very, very much as a value. Um, and um, I loved your concept of the, the top dollar value being sort of critical for getting the river a place at the table. Um, that's, that's a very persuasive argument for for, for this whole approach. Um, so thank you for thinking about this. Thank you for the, for the presentation. Um, we have a talk next month um, about PFOAs. Um, so please look for our announcement second Thursday next month. Um, and please do sign up for the uh, Hudson River Watershed Alliance Conference. Uh, is there anything I'm forgetting, Emily? We're also in the middle of a stream and buffer protection webinar series. We had our first uh, 
presentation yesterday, which is now posted. And so if you'd like to join us for the other lectures that are part of that, uh, which have to do with state regulations, local regulations, and what communities can do to protect their streams and buffers, uh, there's more information on our website. So um, that's great. With no further ado, Dave, thanks so very, very much for uh, joining us from Michigan. Uh, super presentation. Emily, everybody, uh, we'll see you in a month. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much.